Greetings, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents, the H3O Art of Life show. And I have been audacious enough to call this show Men at Work. And what I'm striving to do in this hour that we'll be together is to discuss the things that men take upon themselves to do that are not necessarily as a result of their employment, may be related sometimes, but usually men are about much more than jobs. So I thought I would talk to two men about the work that they do, work that they have done, work that they plan to do uh, around developing, developing the community and enhancing the lives of people like themselves. And so I'd like to introduce Professor Dr. Gaino Brooks, who thinks he's retired, <laughs> <laughs> former president of Malcolm X College, and Dr. Avi Malek Arrington. Yes, pleasure. I did it. You did it. <laughs> yes. That's so perfect. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, gentlemen, I want you to talk about your work. I want to start with Dr. Brooks, if you don't mind. Please do. Because I had an opportunity to work with Dr. Brooks in something that I thought was the most inspired thing. It was called the Karnak Institute, and it was at Malcolm X College, one of the city colleges of Chicago. And I want, to, want you to talk about how that came into being, because it had not been there before your tenure in office. That's right. Well, thank you so much for having me on, uh, Dr. Peace. It's always great to see you. And what a timely topic um, in my life, because as you said earlier in introducing me, uh, I thought I retired on uh, June 28th and was going to have somewhat of a life of leisure. But uh, my phone constantly was ringing and people were constantly asking me to do something uh, to go somewhere, to say something. And uh, I found my life being busier now than it was when I was working a so-called nine to five. So you're right, uh, we don't stop working, uh, not when we're contributing or trying to contribute to the community in the way that we should. And that should be until we die. We should never stop working. We should always have something to offer our community. What started at Malcolm X uh, College as Carnock, the Carnock Wellness Institute, was uh, just a, a phenomenal concept that uh, is one that is still attached to me and one that I will continue. I haven't done much with it at this time because what I'm looking for is a place to host it. Uh, as you remember the Institute, we would meet every Saturday at three o'clock and we would start out with our libations, and then we would have a guest speaker. And I was so blessed and honored to know so many good people who I didn't have to pay, didn't have to cajole them to be there, just explain to them what it was we were doing, and they would come and speak. And as you know, we met there personally. We had known of each other for many years. I had known of you for many years, but personally uh, met you at that time and you came and was one of our guest presenters. And the whole purpose of Carnot was to heal the community. It was to create wellness in the community. And there was no topic that was off limits for us because we tried to cover every uh, aspect of life that we could, uh, be it um, the society as a whole, be it health, uh, be it legal issues. And we had people coming from all over uh, the Chicagoland area who would come and speak and present. And it was just a, a phenomenal uh, program that we had. And we're going to bring the Carnot Wellness Institute back very soon. And I'll call you when we're ready to roll that out 
so that you can help us to get the word out so that we can have those fantastic uh, explanations of what life is really all about and what our role is, each of our roles is in life. And it's to constantly give back to our people. It's constantly to give back and to help someone to bring someone else up. Well, when I was there as a presenter, I realized that this was an empowering thing for the presenters as well as for the audience because we, we in having to do that work, we had to examine our ideas and examine our, ourselves so that we could bring the best of ourselves to the community. The community in turn had to give us something so that we would know if we were reaching them and if we were on the right track. So when we got to the questions and the answers, then you got the clarification and, and it just, it was an exchange, it was reciprocal. And, and when you say you call me when you're ready to roll it out, no, you calling me now because we need to roll this out. And this is a community effort. It needs to be as many people as were willing to come and make presentations need to be willing now to assist in putting this back together because my philosophy is the institutions are in the people, not in the buildings. Yes. And so we still have Karnak. We have it in you and me and all those other people who attended, who presented, who you had had uh, a lot of volunteers who were very helpful uh, in helping to put the program together because there's so many nuts and bolts. You are so right and thank you for that because the co-creator, the co-founder, the co-inspiration of that was Dr. Ingram. Mm -hmm. And he's someone that most of the city knows, a lot of young people knows, just a lot of people know and respect so much. And he and I have talked just a couple of times and he's ready, he's just waiting for me. Whenever you're ready, Brother Brooks, we're gonna go with this because you're right, it is in us. And that's what made Carnock so different as you explained the, uh, the protocols of it. It was not just a lecturer standing in front of a lectern and pointing to maybe something on the board, but it was that interactiveness of Carnock that made it such a great experience and a learning experience for everybody, even the presenters who were there. They enjoyed it and they learned and got so much out of it. So you're right, the call is out, we're ready to roll. All right, now Dr. Arrington, you do know that you're sitting here and we've just put your name in the pot. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure that in whatever way you can be of assistance, you're willing to because you are that spirit. Thank you very Talk much. Talk to me about the work that you've been doing um, here and abroad because you haven't always been local. No, let me start with saying that, and I'm here uh, as well on behalf of Prince Asiel bin Israel, who I have been working uh, with over the past almost 30 years uh, in a journey to build community globally uh, by going back and repatriating back to our ancestral homeland, to Israel, Northeastern Africa, to uh, journey on what we call the social experiment. Uh, in which we were to go back and incorporate the uh, holistic principles of living, a uh, vegan diet, uh, uh, um, uh, a, a preventive wellness program, uh, planting our own food, uh, our own agriculture, uh, just making our own clothes and just uh, being uh, enveloped in, uh, in our land language and culture to speak, read and write. Uh, one of our um, indigenous languages again, which is Hebrew, and as I said, returned to Northeastern Africa as a biblical scholar and a historian that documents the African presence, indigenous African presence in the Bible and the Bible lands. Part of my job was to connect with the indigenous people who are yet there, uh, over a quarter of a million people of African descent that live in Israel proper, but also inhabit Jordan, Egypt, and some of the other surrounding states that connect to us as Africans in the diaspora who look like us, who, who relate to us, and who have been off the radar in terms of in the media. So we, we connected with uh, some of our family, say for instance in Jericho. Jericho, uh, of biblical fame, is also the, historically the longest inhabited city in history. For 10,000 years plus, someone has lived in Jericho. And when you get there, naturally you find the oldest people, folk that look like us, jet black, 
<laughs> with these African features. And one of the awesome stories we often tell in 1972 when we first got to Jericho after arriving in the land in 1968, just uh, months after Martin Luther King prophetically predicted that we would get to the Holy Land as a people. Mm -hmm. uh, months after that, we arrived to fulfill that utterance. Uh, we then journeyed down to Jericho and found folk that looked like us. But the amazing thing is that their oral history, they said that their mothers and their fathers and their grandmothers and grandfathers had told them that their brothers and sister, sisters had been taken away across the water and that one day they would return. And when they receive us, and they receive us that day and every day since 1972, they welcome us in tears and hug us and welcome us as those returned brothers and sisters. So part of our dynamic was reconnecting historically what we call as historians corrective historiography to put back what was taken away during the era of the transatlantic slave trade and uh, neocolonialism and colonialism where we were stripped as a people of our vital history in order to justify the dehumanization of that process. So when we reconnected with that in a holistic way, we then had another um, educational uh, package gift, if you will, for our children. So now we began to grow children who were centered around their, their, their indigenous identity, their global position outside of America, back into what we call uh, the center of the world. At that, see, when we got in that part of the world, we found out that the, the, the news on the nightly news in Chicago became very minuscule. And now you were exposed to global issues that were going on in Africa, specifically in Europe and, and other environs that were connected to African people in the region. So this opened up us to begin to now export uh, what we call holistic living into places like Ghana, where we did the uh, wellness project, where we went and partnered with the Ministry of Health under the um, uh, former uh, General uh, Kwashiga, who is now passed, bless his soul. But he came to Demona, to Israel. He saw what we were doing as Minister of Health and said that, I'd like to export this, take it back to my people, and show how that we could go on a preventive pathway instead of investing in pharmaceuticals. Let's invest in the people, in their diet, in their exercise, their access to water, and fresh food. So that's an example of what we did. Uh, and one of the things that Prince and I and others have been doing on this journey now, after 40 years plus, we began to reassess the direction. Uh, like many organizations, many movements, we had to reassess and see how far we have come and how far we were on the mark. There were some challenges, so we're now readjusting with a, a much more progressive movement of brothers and sisters that want to move from a, a, a mono-type leadership to a collective African-centered, uh, if you will, um, uh, ruling body where we now want our children and the next generation, because we've got three generations there. We're, I've got grandchildren uh, in the Holy Land, and uh, they're about to have some children. Wow. In fact, my grandson just had a baby not too long ago. And so we're evolving to see where do we go next. And coming back to this side, we want to share the benefits of what we've done. So one of the things we achieved, along with SCLC, we established the one of the first international centers for peace and nonviolence. We also, myself and Prince, were active in the first Palestinian conference on nonviolence in 2005. Since then, we've, we've been asked because of our pedigree, if you will, as a nonviolent, peaceful, and holistic community to be active in the Palestinian-Israeli uh, peace process down the pathway of nonviolence. So circumstances in my family brought me back. My mom was not well, my elder brother was not well. And so during this time of more time back on this side, I began to share our benefits and our programs and our victories right here in Chicago, uh, in the community, both in the southern suburbs, both in uh, on the south side and west side that we now are looking to do nonviolence uh, based on King, Dr. King's principles, which we studied with uh, Dr. Um, Bernard Lafayette, who was his chief strategist during the Civil Rights Movement, who was also a scholar in residence at Emory University currently, but he codified King's nonviolent techniques. So we're using that. We're also using, in combination, the principle of restorative justice. 
as I discussed with you earlier, doctor, this is a way to divert our children from the penal system and from the juvenile punishment uh, process where they're marked for life to look at a restorative process wherein they look at the person or persons they have injured, uh, graffiti they might have done, fights they might have had, come face to face with those individuals, feel their pain, and enter into a restorative process of reconciliation as an alternative to punitive judgment. So it moves them away from the penal system and into community. We then look at building uh, what we call life skills management. We look at raising their consciousness of self, of who they are, where they come from, and they being a part of the community that they are one with to seek not to damage themselves by damaging the community. We then move on to social uh, entrepreneurship and, and so many other things of giving back to put the youth on another pathway. Because with all this experience, Dr. Brooks, that we have and, and Dr. Pace, we have to give back. And I know you all are doing that. And uh, as we take it to the next level, we're building these tiers, you know, of a movement of beginning to, as the prince always says, you know, it may take a village to raise a child, but it, it takes the village to continually be involved to raise that adult so that he may in turn recycle the child raising process. Wonderful statement. There are so many things. There are so many things. I want to try to marry what we're talking about now. We're talking about looking for another facility so that Karnak can go forward. And you are talking about doing work that just is running parallel to that. Yes. Sure. Um, and, and certainly there ought to be cooperation between yes. this, these two, two streams. Um, and they may not even be, be separate. They may be the same thing. Same It'll stream. take some talking and some some planning to know to what extent they, they are actually, mm -hmm. you know, on one piece. But mm -hmm. it's wonderful to think that, you know, there is a, um, there is a track record. There is already a model, mm -hmm. you know, that, that Karnak has been tried and mm -hmm. we know what Karnak can do. And I'm, I'm very en enthusiastic about the, the fact that you're here, you know, because <laughs> the, the thing is that we, we, you know, Occupy Until I Come was the, what the prophet Jesus Christ said. Mm. We must occupy where we are. Yes. Even those who, who leave and go to the place where on the on the globe probably is the place where we belong mm -hmm. where we fit right. where all the things all of the things in the environment work together for our upliftment and that's a wonderful thing but that's a privilege and a blessing to be sure. able to enjoy and not all of us can can go there so for those of us who will not be able for whatever reasons to travel outside of the narrow confines of communities, we have to also provide for them. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. Garvey said, African, Africa for the Africans, mm -hmm. those at home and we those abroad. abroad yeah. We have to, this holistic living, and I love when you say 1972, because you know, everybody's talking environmentalism, sustainability, <laughs> mm -hmm. green, and what right, have you. Right. Well, here are some people who had good sense in 19, before 1972, because sure. they made right. the move That's in right. 1972. Mm -hmm. They knew about preventive medicine. They knew about holistic health care. They knew about how uh, the, the proper diet. They knew, they knew the truth about how to live in this human body. And so oh. now here you have all these people coming along and they're writing books yes. and they're, <laughs> they're having workshops and they're just doing all these things and they're allegedly initiating or introducing these ideas that have been in practice and been tried and tested and proven. You know, yes. and I suppose you found some stuff that worked better than some other stuff. True enough. So you <laughs> had to you had True to enough. discard some stuff. That's right. But the whole point is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. No. That That's we right. actually do have in our within ourselves That's right. what it takes 
to do for self because that's, that's right. what you described. That's true. A do for self community like that's the right. Honorable Elijah Muhammad envision, mm -hmm. like the Marcus Garvey envision, like uh, Delaney envision. I mean, yes. we just have a long history of people who have been telling us that we must learn to do for self. That's right. And now here you're sitting here in flesh and blood, both of you, <laughs> you know, leading the way. You know, I'm excited. You know, I'm almost ready to go take a look at the, at the, at the model okay. because it's such a wonderful thing to know that we can, we can aim in this direction. Yes. You know, we can, we can do this. That's right. And we, we can, can flex our muscles That's and right. find out how powerful we are. Yes, yeah. up your mind to people. You, you, Dr. Pisa, and, that, and that's why you, you're so beautiful. I mean, you've seen this connection r right here. And Brother Arrington and I have been talking for some time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe the last two years. That's right. We got to get together. We got to get together. But we g have gotten caught up in our own little things and been going and going when this model is here for something that we both are interested in, that we both can work on and bring more people in and make it happen, can make it happen. I think that this is a natural. This yes. is what Karnak is about. This is Karnak. It's no different. That's right. No. Except for some pieces of it is overseas, but it's still where our people are, and wherever our people are, we're one and the same. Dr. Sure. Leonard Ingram, as you said, the co-founder of Karnak, you know. That's right. Here's another, you know, there's another powerful element in this, in this whole thing. And the thing is, you know, the, without vision, as it said, the people perish. Yes, where right. there is no vision, no there, vision. we must have vision. There yes. must be something to aspire to. That's you right. can't. You you cannot live your life of years every day, getting up, doing the very same thing over and over, with no change, no improvement, no sign that this makes a difference one way or the other. Right. There needs to be always some purpose, some mission, some gratification that you get for having done the right thing and uh, for have uh, been of service to someone, yes. to, 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 to have earned the right to, to occupy the earth, yes. you yes. know. And so it, when, you, when you can think about things like this, it just, it's, I think that this, when this is presented, to people, they will embrace it because this is what they want. This is what they try to do when they form their little social organizations. That's right. You know, and they give banquets and teas and, and all kind of little social things. People want to assemble. Yeah. They right. want to be engaged. They want to do fulfilling things. That's right. They just need to, as you say, when once you got <laughs> <laughs> Once you get to the to the homeland, yes, it stopped being so provincial. That's right. It stopped being about the neighborhood, the south side and the west side. It started being about the globe. The yes. globe, yes. And issues that were huge became, as you said, trivia. That's right. You know, why are we spending all day on this? <laughs> you know, when we can grow food. That's right. right. When we can make clothes, when we can adorn ourselves with our own jewelry. That's I mean, right. I've seen, I think people actually have found gifts and talents that they may not have that known they, they didn't had. have. That's exactly Tell right. Tell us some more about you that. You know, and it was funny. We, in the early days, we always talk about people who came, uh, we made the journey, uh, who had degrees. And uh, there's a joke that, that, that many of them had to roll up their sleeves uh, and begin the process of building and use a degree for toilet tissue uh, because uh, it, was, it wasn't any application. It was ir irrelevant. It, it was irrelevant. And so you're right, various talents that uh, people began to write and sing and produce plays that they had never mm. done. We always encourage people to reach their, their true human potential. If there was something that you desired to do, some gift that God gave you that you want to share with the world, 
we're always encouraged, and to this day, for them to reach that goal, to, to go beyond the inhibitions mm -hmm. and try something different and come out of your comfort zone. Uh, I have one, one brother who returned here who, who's uh, working, he, was, uh, he used to write grants. Uh, now he, he is the owner of a, a tofu factory that is now uh, putting tofu in Whole Foods and putting, taking them into, into the region, uh, at Wisconsin to, to Indiana. It's just time for the concept of him changing his paradigm. Mm -hmm. I have another brother who was doing, um, he was doing real estate development. He likewise has a, a food production company that now he supplies and caters. Uh, and we could go on and on hmm. in terms of just going to what we call your God mind mm -hmm. and seeing what is the need and what is my talent and mm -hmm. how do I address it. Mm -hmm. And this is what we want to bequeath to our young people. Mm -hmm. We want them not to be limited to a job mm -hmm. per se, just over broke. We want them to look at a business, sustainable if you will, because as you said, we've been sustainable <laughs> since the 60s and right. have been sustaining. So mm -hmm. this new concept of green as it's being given to us maybe by the outside community, we got a handle on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're connecting with, um, with brothers like Fred Carter out at the uh, mm -hmm. Black Oaks, mm -hmm. you know, sure. and mm -hmm. he's teaching and his wife, uh, Dr. Shifunza, right. Mm -hmm. right, they're teaching these techniques to our youth and at the Betty Shabazz and other places and now we, we're connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. So we even looked at, Fred and I looked at a program of bringing youth over from Zimbabwe to study holistic agriculture because you know President Mugabe confiscated land but without our mind to be applied to that strategy it, it doesn't make correct sense. Mm -hmm. Huge tracts of farmland that was industrial mm -hmm. but now if we can renew and retool the minds of our young people here and there we can then take another vantage point uh, in terms of controlling our, yes. our assets and our resources because Zimbabwe and South Africa and other African countries are bread baskets that feed Europe to this day through mm -hmm. export. Mm -hmm. So we, we can look and see mm -hmm. how we connect the dots globally. You know, Dr. King said that in, in justice anywhere is a, is a threat, front to, threat to justice, justice everywhere. everywhere. So this is this global community, as you said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the, the, the cover of the Muhammad Speaks, that Prince always talks mm -hmm. about the hands reaching mm -hmm. across the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know NSA 46 and the document that said, prevent that connection mm -hmm. between indigenous yes. Africans, their wealth, mm -hmm. and African Americans. So we see that for our vision, we see that we're in a time in which humanity will benefit from the African diaspora coming back together, applying principles of sustainability and humanity to uplift all people. You know, first Africa renews itself, and so the rest of the world will also be renewed in this process. It's, it's just, it, isn't it wonderful to <laughs> just, just think about that? Yes. And to think about our children becoming multilingual rather than monolingual. Sure. You know, there's all this emphasis on, you know, you have to have uh, standard English. Well, that's fine. But what about some standard tree? Yes. Or some standard right. Hebrew, Hebrew, you uh, know. Swahili. Our children, our children, I've, I've, having been a teacher for as many years as I was, one of the things that I learned was that children learn better when they have more than one language to work with. Yes. Because English is a very, I'm not really sure you should call it a language. <laughs> I think you probably should call it a lingua franca, mm. which means that it's a contrivance. It's a, it's a polyglot. It's a, yes. it's a, it's a melting pot and it's not everything in there is melted. They've taken <laughs> yes. from every, right. every language. It actually was a trader language. That's it was right. invented so that the uh, Europeans could, could ex make exchanges or trade with the indigenous people. And consequently, they brought in everything, they threw everything in it, which mm. is the reason why plurals you know, you can't always rely on adding S or ES. Right. Nothing, right. you can't rely on the pronunciation <laughs> no, because can't. vowels have what, how many diacritical marks? You just have 15 different ways to say A <laughs> yes. and all of this kind of thing. Well, other languages, languages have constants. 
Yes. The vowel sounds are always the same <laughs> yes. in the same environment. That's right. So when you, when you teach a child rudimentary Spanish, for example, and they get the relationship between the vowel sound of A or E or I or whatever, and see that every time they see that, it's going to have the same sound, then they can translate that understanding to English some of the time enough of the time to get the hang of English and then to learn what the exceptions are. So our children need language, yes, not just English, yeah. no. they need languages. And it's exciting to them. They love to be able yes, to say the date or <laughs> say the greeting or say their name yes. or anything, no matter how minor, they love, they love the mystery of it. So the, the, you, your children learn to Absolutely. speak Hebrew. Yes. Your children learn to read it and to write That's it. That's right, and Arabic as well. How wonderful is that? <laughs> you know, Incredible. It's, it's just amazing, and our children are not retarded. No, they are. They can learn whatever any other human being on the planet can learn. That's right. That's our true. children can learn it. That's true. And that, I mean, we've got, what, millions of years of history that says That's right. that we knew how to know. <laughs> <laughs> we knew how to know yes. astronomy, we knew how to know right. mathematics, we knew how to know Created all the it. sciences. Yes. So we know how to know. That's right. So we know how to learn. That's right. So the thing is that if you open up, if you open up this potential, if you give this potential discipline, yes. if you say, Search within yourself and find you. There is a gift in you. Search within yourself and find it and yes. show it to me. Let me yes. see it. That's and it. when it comes out, you know, not perfect, but be just beginning to yes. mm -hmm. to blossom. Praise it. That's right. And cultivate it so yes. that that nurture that can it. yes nurture it. Yes. And you've done that. We've done that. You've done that for 40 years, 32 years, yes. or how long? And we'll continue 40 years plus. 40 years plus. Yes. How did you, how did you dare come back here? <laughs> because how did you ever want to leave? Uh, I didn't, but the, uh, the creator, you know, providence has a way, you know, and I often share with my people, there are many paths that the creator would have you walk, and every man's path is not the same. And certainly, sometimes it goes around the mountain, around the mm. bend, over the river, and come down through the valley, mm -hmm. only to return to the place from whence you came. Mm -hmm. But there's something then the journey that you're to come back and share with as a gift to those, as you said, didn't have the blessing to make the journey. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the time, the wherewithal, mm -hmm. the inclination, or the inspiration. The orientation. Or the orientation. Mm -hmm. But they may be able to receive that which you bring back and lay at the feet of the community mm -hmm. that will enhance and build. And those who are to receive it will, and those who are not yes. ready for this will not. And that's, mm -hmm. that's their prerogative, and that's, that's right. fine, because everything, as you pointed out earlier, is in divine order. It's in divine order. And so it will, so, so it is. And so it is. And so it is. And, and you know, you don't need 100% of anything. You just need a critical mass, mm -hmm. okay. just a critical mass that is dedicated, that is conscious and willing to do the work. And that's all we, we look for, is for those people who want to do the work, who want to be conscious, who want to contribute, who want to give back. And those people will come and do what they can, as you do each and every day, okay. to do that, to help our people and to make us grow. To help ourselves. You no can't doubt. help other people without helping yourself, do for some, even yeah. if other people don't take part in or take advantage of what you think that you are offering. You improve yourself. You know, you become a better person just in the course of thinking that you're trying to do something for somebody else. But you get the first fruits of it. You get the first right. benefit of your efforts on behalf of, of others. Yes. And it probably takes that kind of um, ego tripping to make you make you do something you know you right. think you doing, doing something, something you uplifting somebody else over here here you are down in a pit that's right you know and but you are uplifting somebody no actually you are let raising your own level of consciousness yes. so it's it's wonderful to to think that we can can ponder this sort of thing 
and that it, you know it has been so that we know that it can be yeah. we're not looking for something that you know is is, is we're not dreaming like martin we don't right. we don't have a dream anymore we have a reality That's right. that we want to replicate Yes, we do. Yes, and I know that I want you to talk a little bit about restorative justice. Are you finding these people already involved in the criminal justice system? Mm. They're already there. They've well, already. We got two tiers, Doc, that okay. we're trying to that we're addressing. Uh, first, uh, unbeknownst to myself, uh, before landing back in on Plymouth Rock. Okay, we gotta keep his spirit alive. But um the sixth district, uh, which is just uh, in the southern part of uh, metropolitan Chicago, has the highest juvenile involvement with with the ju with the court system in the country. Really? In the country. So I was in a meeting last week uh, with what we call the Southland Alliance mm -hmm. and uh, the statistic came up and I realized that I was standing at the wellspring of, uh, of issue for our young people uh, and that I and my staff and my colleagues had an ability now and an opportunity to address it full force. Uh, also Arnie Duncan testified, uh, he was speaking at American University uh, last Friday and uh, I actually gave um, not last Friday before last but I gave the article to to in out in my meeting where it said uh, he testified to a recent study that showed that black and Latino students are experiencing experiencing harsher punishments than their white counterparts mm -hmm. this we already yes. know but now it's been statistic statistically supported and documented and Chicago is number three on the list so what we're seeing is that um, unnecessarily and prematurely our young people are being pushed into the penal system mm -hmm. to go into that, that whole uh, um, um, economics of confinement that we know that private prisons on, um, Prison Inc. is on the uh, Wall Street now, it's on the NASDAQ. Uh, and uh, so people are investing uh, in the fact that you can build a private prison and draw from the government anywhere from thirty-five to $50,000 a year for each inmate as a product. So we see that again, if we can divert uh, this flow into the penal system, and into this uh, obviously unnecessarily harsher punishment. Restorative justice says reconciliation and healing is a part of community and a part of this village that we're building. So now, rather than, and this is, a, and, and I, I'll give you an example. One of my staff members lost her brother to a drive-by shooting. Um, she said that after she sat in the courtroom and uh, the uh, trigger man got 60 years and the second guy got 32 years. She said she still didn't feel any satisfaction. Mm -hmm. It didn't bring her brother back. It wasn't closure. It wasn't say. closure. Mm -hmm. So this is how she got involved in restorative justice, to bring closure personally. And now, as one who testifies about victims, survivors of victims, and restorative justice, when you sit down and you engage that person who has made the hurt, and we don't use terms like uh, victim and uh, perpetrator, uh, it is the he who offended and he who was offended and when you sit down with that person face to face and the person who was the victim shares the hurt and the family then there is a sense of connectedness that comes from the person who did the hurt when he then commits that he will do something to try and restore and reconcile with the family mm -hmm. with those who he's hurt then there is a connection and a bond that then is created and then they see themselves as part of the same community because then we find out why is it that the young man or the young woman did this thing what were the circumstances in their family and their background within themselves that said that they needed to be uh, to belong to something that someone says, okay, this is the test for the gang, go out and shoot, go out and stab, go out and do this. Why did you feel that you had to do this? And so this process of exchange, of seeing where the person really came from and how they affected someone adversely, not intentionally in their mind, we then have a bond that is created. And now community, the parents of those who committed who uh, the offense, 
and the parents of those who were the offended, the community, the aunts, the uncles, the, the other stakeholders in the community are involved in, in this circle, the restorative justice circle. So it is, a, is it a, almost like a hearing or more like the, the African-centered circle, uh, the council, if you will. And so this is another level of engagement where the young people are at the forefront of it and then the parents and the teachers and the other stakeholders. So now we have community moving forward to heal the hurt and to restore that which was taken away. Well, you know, this is, this is right straight out of African culture. Yes. Mm -hmm. Straight yes, out of it. There was, um, uh, well, there are several things. One is uh, Facing Mount Kenya by Jomo Kenyatta. Yes, yes. And then there, the, the parallel, the fiction piece based upon African culture uh, was uh, by Chinua. Uh, things fall Achebe. apart. Things fall apart. Yes. Good. Yes. We're on the same page. <laughs> yes, we are. What it, what happens is if the community is violated, a member of the community is violated from another community. Uh, they didn't use the term tribe. This tribe thing is like the N word. You yeah. know, that, that was just another kinship group violated a, a different kinship group. What they would do was they would send uh, two things. They would send an implement of war mm. and also a symbol of peace. Yes. They would send it to the other community. The community could choose whether it wanted to make amends in a peaceful way or whether or not it wanted to go to war. And it would return, it would send back whatever its response was. If they sent back the symbol of peace, then the negotiations began for how to bring healing and wholeness and peace. If they sent back the implement of war, then it, it was on. It was on. You know, it was on. Mm. So we, you know, we have millions of years on this planet. You yeah. cannot be on the planet for millions of years and have no idea how to live. Obviously, we had to know how to live or we would not still be here because there have been plenty of efforts to remove us from the planet and we still insist that we're not only gonna be here, but we're going to pursue things when on the face of it we could get in a room right now and you could describe this and I, there'd be 10 people in there who would tell you why this wouldn't work okay. mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they have they have doubts about our ability to make peace right they uh, have doubts yeah. about our bil ability to trust each other which has to be the foundation of mm -hmm. reconciliation. Yes. You cannot accept an apology and forgive someone who is likely to stab you in the back. Right. And if you think that that person is likely to do that, then you're certainly not going to reconcile and it'll be tentative and superficial right. and That's it's right. not going to hold. That's right. So the, the just to have the audacity to believe in a concept called restorative justice to say, we can do this, mm, can do you know. It. No, you can't because, you know, they'll tell you all the reasons right. why. But the thing is, we're going to do something. Yes. We're not going to sit here. And do nothing. We're not going to go, we're not going to arm ourselves and go out and eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So that we're going to address this. Yes. We're going to address this. We're going to attempt this. If it doesn't work this time, we're going to attempt it again. We're going to refine it. We're mm. going to re we're going to address it. We're going to tweak it. We're going to do whatever. But we are going to continue to aim toward peace. Yes. Absolutely. That's our yes. goal. We insist that we're going to have peace and we're not going to have a war in an effort to create peace cuz that's 1984 talk. Okay. That's right. Doc, I want to footnote also there's a part of our uh, strategy is that we're also uh, working with a group called Men Against Violence based out of Atlanta. And part of our initiative also is to address uh, domestic violence from a man's perspective in terms of being those who have made a, 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 um, an environment where it's acceptable. 
So part of uh, what we're doing, we're doing, because I want to get this in too, it's very important, uh, because it's also part of a transformational process in how we, in the quote, macho, male-centered sense of things, and even in our pat patriarchal societies, uh, if not governed properly, we can leave room for abuse. And what we want to do is offset that. So Men Against Violence is a group of men who are committed to changing men's concepts and making a welcome environment for abuse, whether it's through songs, the media, whether it's through our attitudes about women, uh, that we have to come back into this co-partnership as a biblical scholar, it, it's, for me, it's supported when it says that, that he created the male and female. He created them. And in Hebrew, it's sustained that when we say uh, the male, Adam, it actually means the male and the feminine attributes fused as one. And so as we go back and look at attitudes, uh, what we're doing in the schools, we're doing that with anti-bullying and also looking at violence in, in dating. Uh, it's very important that we set another standard, as you know, lately in the media with uh, Chris Brown and Rihanna and that whole scenario as it's evolved, it's, it's put it in the limelight and our children, many of them are looking at them as role models, uh, but we have to offset those things and look at how we check our assumptions. So I wanted to say that's one of the, as we look at nonviolence as a way of life, as Dr. King says, it's a lifestyle for courageous people. It's not for cowards, you know, it's not, nonviolence is not being a wimp, you know, and turning the other cheek per se. Nonviolence is challenging injustice with what he calls soul force. Mm -hmm. And that soul force is the empowerment when you know that the arc of the universe, as he often quoted, is tilted toward justice. And so restorative justice, uh, nonviolent intervention, anti-bullying, and being men against domestic violence are the pathways that we're bringing together as we reassess our community, our priorities, and our humanity. Uh, I want to say that this is a time in which our humanity is, is now coming to the forefront. It's not just enough to be Afrocentric. You have to be human-centric. Mm -hmm. And so all the rights and privileges and the justice that's, that, that's necessary to make a community whole again, from our relationships, our personal relationships, uh, the concept of ownership, whether it's ownership of the man, ownership of the woman, Possessive. possessiveness and stalking and all these other things. We've got to put these things in check uh, so that we can heal. The greatest thing, one of the greatest things that Prince often says that we emerge from that social experiment is that while we address all the holistic aspects in so many ways, we still had much work to do in mental health, mental holistic health. Because oftentimes we make mm. a change with our culture, our dress and this and that, but we don't change the inside to transcend. So if anything that we'd like to continue, like the Karnak Institute, is and your show constantly allows us a space to transcend, to take our attributes as humans, as, a, as Africans who go back millions of years, and to help as we see humanity to reshape itself, because so as Africa and Africans do, whether it's the, the jitterbug of the 50s or hip hop or break dancing, we know that the peoples follow us and the things that we do that God has given us as gifts to the world. Mm. So as we turn that eye again, it's time to uh, envision humanity and re-envision a, a new humanity led with this ancient African consciousness. Uh, our, our good friend um, wrote a book called Ancient Future. I think it was um, um, mm, his name. Anyway, he's a, he's a great student of uh, Renoko Rashidi and, and others. But ancient future is where we're at, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, there's a very talented European writer. Um, he wrote a book called Last Days of Ancient Sunlight, mm. where he talks about the fact that the, 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 the quality of life and society can most be uh, touched if we look back to the ancient indigenous societies. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that that light was the last ancient light, he said, but in order to go forward, European society, he's saying, 
has to benefit and go back and study and take the lessons from those ancient cultures. And that's where we are. We're positioned with this sustainable, mm -hmm. exportable intellect of how to live harmoniously with the Creator and His creation. It's an awesome blessing, it's an awesome opportunity, and it's an awesome responsibility. Because, you know, we can, we can have all the rhetoric we want to have, we can, you know, do all the things uh, that we say we're going to do or not. But ultimately, there is an ultimate judge yes. of this behavior, this conduct, yes. you know. And so, you know, the time, I think this, this time in history um, that is so trying, there's just so much hardship and so much suffering and yes. intensified. Mm -hmm. And you cannot go a single day without learning of the suffering of some an uh, other person, maybe a friend, a family member, a neighbor mm -hmm. who has suffered a great loss. Right. You know, maybe the loss of a, a dear one, maybe the loss of home, maybe the loss of, of employment, um, all kinds of things. But the, 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 the opportunity for us to rethink, and you, as you say, to transcend our attachment to all of these things on which we have relied for far too long. That's right. We have been dependent for on unstable, transient things for far too long, things that were not sustainable. We have learned to rely on, you know, like leaning on air, right. you know, thinking <laughs> it will support you. <laughs> no. uh, and it, it, we, it's a wake-up call. You know, and for some of us, it will be shocking for other of us who see in it the blessing and the opportunity and the responsibility. We can embrace it and say, oh, now we get a chance to, you know, sure. yes. for you t were telling me before we came on. Now that you are no longer on a J-O-B, what do you say, just over just broke? Just over broke. Yeah. <laughs> now that you are no longer on That's a fair. just over broke. <laughs> right. You can now, you have already found that you probably don't know how you found the time to work. That's exactly what I found right. when I retired. I said, mm. wait a minute, how did I ever go to work? Yes. Right. Because I am, I, it takes an entire day to live an entire day. All day long, That's right. That's right. there is something that you must do or desire to do or someone wants you to do. So there's plenty of work. Was <laughs> with the, <laughs> the harvest are, is great. plentiful, yeah. but the laborers are few. Yes. There's plenty to labor over. There's plenty of opportunity to make your life worth living, and mm -hmm. and that's all really you're supposed to be doing here. Right. You didn't come here right. to to shop. You didn't come <laughs> here to make a great impression upon yeah. somebody. Everybody here who is. He, who is here is transient. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all on our way somewhere else, home, hopefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, but the whole point is we have now this great opportunity before us to, you know, to, to, to really get our minds and hearts and hands on something of some magnitude. Yes. That's right. I'm and, happy. And, and we have to do that. We have to do that. And we're ready. The time is right. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Avi is right. Uh, the time is here. The time is now. Let's do it. Let's do Let's it. Go Let's go to work. Let's go to work. So uh, you've already been doing your work. So <laughs> well. you, but you know, we only have a few minutes left. But I just wanted to tell you that I, I know the truth, as my brother-in-law says. I know the truth. <laughs> and I know the truth about your testimony about the, the, the domestic violence and the, and the, the date rape and the date violence mm. because... I have actually seen that with my own eyes. Mm. I know about it. I went to a, an alternative high school and they were making posters to put up on the, on the walls and the halls of the school be, about date violence, date you violence, know. Yes. And I discovered the, a statistic, and that is that in the, in the South suburbs in particular, mm -hmm. the incidence of domestic abuse and date rape was higher 
than it was any place else. Not even in the metropolitan areas in the city was right. it, per, you know, per capita, yeah. was it greater. That's right. And so I said, Lord, these men mm. are commuting to these jobs and they're mm. coming home and beating up their wives. Mm. Mm. You know, and you see these beautiful houses right. and these luxury cars right. and the children are in good schools right. and you think they're living happily ever after. No, they're not. not. So. not they're sure. statistic. That there's domestic violence going on behind those doors. There are girls who are going out with these boys, girls who live in those houses going out with these boys who live in these houses that are being violated That's right. on dates from people they, they ought to, by people they ought to be able to trust. That's right. So we have, we have a lot of stuff under the rug. We do. We've got a lot of stuff that's concealed because you know, people don't want to say, you know, people don't want to confess yes. That's right. that they're That's suffering true. from those kinds of things. But there's a lot of healing that we need. Yes, it is. Yes. Are you, are you doctor? Yes. Mm -hmm. Doctor? Yes, we're ready now. <laughs> okay, you got a prescription? We got a prescription. Got a prescription. Yes, we do. Okay, and you, you got the, the herbs? We got it. You have the herbs. Yes, we do. We don't want to put drugs in it because no, we know no. drugs is a problem in no, our community. Right. It's all that's natural. Right. right. All so natural. we got an, a natural, we have natural remedies for human problems. Absolutely. Mm, and as you said, that natural remedy is our history. For sure. Knowing, going, that was the purpose of Karnak, just knowing our history. We have remedies for all of our problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of our problems. If we go back and look at our history, know what our people have already done. We've been kings and queens. Great astronomers, great, great mathematicians, great, great engineers. Mm. All that knowledge is with us. Yet. And we, the mm. world needs us. Yes, as, as Obama said, we are the ones we've been looking for. We've, <laughs> <laughs> we've been right. searching for Man leadership right. out there. Yeah. The Looking leadership is for within. Sure. When we are, we are it. We are, it. We are, we are those it. that we've been searching for. Well, gentlemen, I just want to shake hands Blessing. and just thank you ever so much for making this, this program what it has been. And I hope it has been an inspiration. I certainly feel very exhilarated after having had this conversation. And I know that there will be other conversations to follow and then there will be other work. But the main thing is to find a place, I would think that some of these churches yes. that are not busy during the week might have a space that they might allow to be used. We don't need to take it over, we just come and mm -hmm. show them how to do Karnak. That's right. You know, Karnak needs, it needs to be a university. And universities always have colleges. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's Everywhere. Right. Branches, Everywhere. satellite centers, all over the place. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, on that note, before we go, I'd just like to offer up, because the church is one of the great networks in the black community, that we open and look forward to connecting. Our Future Foundation, which is our youth foundation, Better World, and Ethical Solutions are reaching out to our churches, our community centers. All right. All right. Very good. Did we get it all in? The motive is the message. A call for unity. The motive is the message. A call for unity. Let us share one mind through a vision of our future. While we're holding hands to form a circle around our motherland. All around the world, she is calling home her children. One mind will take us there, and we will celebrate our union. <laughs>